Hey everyone, it is so good to be here with you all on this beautiful day, wherever you're at, whenever you are listening to this. And I hope that we can connect and engage with the heart of God, open up some scripture and be encouraged in the name of Jesus. So before we get started, I thought we could play just a little game because I love games. And this is a simple game of would you rather? So the first question, which is very close to my heart, is would you rather eat white chocolate, milk chocolate, or dark chocolate? Which one would you rather? I know there is a strong uh, fan base for the dark chocolate world, and um, I don't know if I'll ever get there, but apparently I will. So, hmm, who knows? Would you rather dawn or dusk? Which one would you rather? Me, personally, I would for sure prefer dawn, although both times are quite special. Would you rather a beach holiday where you can sit back, relax, and kind of soak in the sun and the water, or would you rather a sightseeing holiday where you are out and you're visiting places after COVID, of course, and you are seeing a bunch of things and experiencing this incredible adventure? Which one would you rather? Would you rather eat in bed or eat on the floor? I know there is so many people who are like, no way to eating in bed, but maybe eating on the floor is something that tickles your fancy. Final question, would you rather know where you're going or go with the flow? So I am definitely a kind of like, I need to know where I'm going kind of girl. A couple of years ago, um, my husband and son and I went to New Zealand and Hunter was only 10 months at the time, so um, we needed to figure out how to get there with a car seat and, and all that kind of stuff. So we stayed in Sydney the night before and decided to travel in the morning to the airport from my cousin's house. The plan was that Zane was going to drop us off at the airport, go and park the car at a friend's house who was a couple of maybe five kilometers away from the airport and then catch an Uber back. So we jumped in the car with plenty of buffer time and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the blue line on the maps, which is the blue line to just saying, hey, you're going to be fine. This is going to be a great trip. You're going to get there when you want. Well, that blue line started turning orange and that's when we started getting a little, okay, what's going on, you know, hmm. and then that orange line turned red. Now that red line is a straight up you know what, you should have left two hours in advance because you ain't gonna get there on time. That red line signified massive delays and there were actually two sets of accidents on the way to the airport. So our window of time, our buffer that we had put in place started getting smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where we were like thinking, what do we do? What's what's the next plan? We've got the car, there's no one around that could just you know, drop us off and take the car for us. So we just stuck to the original plan was to just drop us off. And so I went up to the lady and Zane um, shot back to drop the car off. And I said to the lady, hey, this is what's happening. Um, My husband's coming. Do I check in now? Do I wait for him? And she was like, yeah, no worries. She was just really chilled, which was the complete opposite of how I was feeling. No matter what I was portraying, I was panicking on the inside. And she was like, yeah, all good. You do have to go and check in your pram. And I was like, oh my goodness, okay. Because I had my 10 month old little Pumba of a son who wasn't walking. And so I had to carry him plus a bunch of blankets, plus a baby bag, plus our carry on. So I had a bunch of things that I was kind of relying on the pram for. So I had to check that in. Now I'm a bit of a clean freak. You know, I kind of like things to be like clean and I wouldn't just put my son anywhere, but he was so heavy and I was getting so stressed and I needed to just put everything on the floor that we were on the floor at the airport, just waiting. And I was texting Zane saying like, where are you? What's happening? How far? Like all of these questions. He was probably gone for about 35, 40 minutes and it felt like over an hour. I'm sure you can relate to one of these kind of scenarios. 
And then I'm kind of freaking out because I know that the time to, to check in is getting really, really close to the end. And so I went up to the lady and I was like, you know, how much more time? Like, is he going to make it? Um, if I just go in first and then he can come after me and she goes, Oh, you've got about 10 minutes. It's all good. So I went back to my spot and I was like, Oh, please just get here. Please just get here. And then all of a sudden I see my handsome, beautiful new way in Tahitian Maori man running along the windows and he came in and I was like, go check in over there. And he ran to the desk and he checked in and I was like, that's my husband. That's my husband. Like explaining. And the lady was like, Oh, and you've got two minutes to spare. And we were like, Whoa. And she goes, but you do need to hurry to get to the plane on time. So we grabbed our stuff. We jumped in the little transit bus that was taking us the shuttle from the, the, um, the airport to the gate where we had to go and we got in, we settled ourselves. And as soon as that plane took off, the three of us knocked out. We were just like, <sighs> probably from all the stress, but it's amazing what you will do, what you will move, what you'll handle or go through when there's a mission and when there's a purpose. And that's exactly what I'm talking about today. One of my favorite things is purpose. I want to read to you a scripture found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 10 and 11. And it says this, this is God speaking. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey from a far off land, a man to fill my purpose. What I have said that I will bring about, what I have planned that I will do. So let me ask you this question. What's your purpose? I know this could be a very confronting question to some people. And for some people, maybe we know what it is. So don't just click off just yet. Don't disengage because we can have a purpose for our lives. And then there can also be purposes that are seasonal depending on what the situation is. Let me just encourage you around this particular thought. A plan is a method or scheme to make something happen. But a purpose is the reason why something exists. So let me challenge you with this. Don't fill your life up with plans. Fill it with purpose. Don't fill your life up with plans. Fill it with purpose. We are really good at filling our life up with plans with schedules and appointments and our calendars can be full. And then COVID comes along and completely changes everything. So now we are getting used to this new kind of normal. And then things start to open up again and and activities start to open up again. And then we are back in the thick of it, filling us our plans and our schedules up again. And then things might go back to being canceled again and stopping. So what does our life revolve around? The plans that we're making or the purpose, the why, the reason and the meaning behind why something exists? There's three things that I want to share with you today. Three pillars or statements or revelations, whatever you want to call it, that came to me in such a real and personal way that I have taken these on and I have completely applied this to my life. And I want to share it with you this morning. And when it comes to your purpose, the first thing that we need to do is define it. Define your purpose. I'm just going to show you my yoga mat here that I've had for many years. Now, when you exercise or when you do any kind of thing, you got to lay this out and you got to get on top of it in order for you to begin your exercise. I want you to, for now, imagine that this is a prayer mat and you've got to lay it out. You've got to lay out your yoga mat and you've got to get on top of it and you've got to lay there, kneel, stand, whatever, sit. And you've got to seek God about your purpose. There is something so powerful when we actually ask our creator, the one who made us, the one who understands us from the inside out. When we ask him, God, what is our purpose? What is it that you have placed that I can step into in my life? He's not forcing it, but he does offer something. 
What is it that God has placed inside of you? What kind of seed might be stirring at the moment? Something that might have been planted a long time ago and for some reason now it's kind of coming coming up. What is it that is in your hand? Something that you can do and you can do well that God could use to build his kingdom. We can build our little kingdoms. We can build our family and our own kind of vision for our lives. But what is it that God is able to do inside of your life? And the only way we're ever going to discover that is if we define it, is if we spend time in prayer, seeking after the heart of God. What is it that you want from me? The second thing that we can do is to discipline our purpose. Yep, you heard me, discipline it. Now, back in the day, if we didn't have dumbbells, we were encouraged to use cans. So do you like my little chickpea cans that I'll be using today? We need to discipline our purpose. We need to work it. And discipline is hard. It is challenging. We don't always wake up in the morning and be like, yeah, let's get disciplined because it's not something that we are super excited about. It's challenging, it stretches us, it hurts, it pushes us out of our comfort zone. But when we discipline our purpose, let me tell you this, friends, we are able to then look at different situations in life and see what it is that feeds our purpose. Those are the things that I'm going to say yes to. That's disciplining your purpose. And the things that starve our purpose, I'm going to say no to those things. So when a situation presents itself in your life and you think about your purpose and, okay, is this going to, is this going to benefit my purpose that I've defined, that I've spent time with God? And I'm going to honor that purpose by saying yes, because this situation that has presented itself, it's good. It benefits. It's awesome. And then something else presents itself and we think, okay, we are going to have to invest our time, our energy, maybe our money family, whatever it is, if it feeds your purpose, then may it be a resounding yes. If it starves your purpose, then sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to say, no, that's not something that I need to have in my life. Every time you decide to say yes to the Holy Spirit, say yes to love, say yes to serving others, you are increasingly feeding your purpose. Every time we are sold out for the kingdom of God in a healthy way, our purpose is being strengthened. Our purpose is being disciplined, but it's being strengthened. And every time we can look at a situation and say, actually, I think someone else can do that. And I'm giving myself to this then we are also disciplining our purpose. In the mornings, I have made a bit of a habit of waking up a little bit earlier than I need to in order for me to have something that has become so precious to me, and that is soul time. I've got it in my alarm as soul time. I come downstairs, I light my candles, and I go and put the kettle on, and while the kettle's boiling, I'll unpack the dishwasher, listen to a podcast or listen to the, an audio book. At the moment, I'm listening to The Desire of Ages by Auntie Ellen. And I do that as quickly as I can. And then I come over here and I sit on this beautiful rug, comfortable, warm, and I pray. And sometimes I'm on my knees. Sometimes I'm sitting. Sometimes I've laid out on my tummy, just kind of falling before the Lord. And then I get up and I study his word. And that is something that I need to do because it defines my purpose. It disciplines my purpose. It allows me to connect with the heart of God so that it, the rest of the day I am set up like the words of Matt Redmond's song, 10,000 Reasons, that whatever may pass and whatever comes before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. That little habit that I've instilled has become a pattern in my life. And that pattern has allowed my purpose to be louder than any other plan that I might have. And that is something that is important to me. 
It's actually become a massive priority in my life to be spending that time with Jesus. So whether I've defined my purpose a long time ago, last week, yesterday, I'm still going to keep defining what it is that God's got laid out for the day, laid out for the week, laid out for the season. As a mother, as a wife, as a chaplain, as a colleague, as a daughter, whatever it is, there's a, there's a lot of different roles that we play. And I cannot for one second imagine that I can do this without him. I don't want to. I want to spend that time with Jesus in the morning and I want it to set me up for the day. And I encourage you to do the same. You know, I've been reading throughout the Psalms so many times where it references in the morning, in the morning, in the morning. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not a morning person. Okay, that's all good. But can I challenge you to maybe just give it a go? Just try, not just one day, maybe not even just two days, but do it for a week, do it for three weeks, do it for a month and watch how all of a sudden there's a change in you. There's something that no matter how hard the days are, you know that you've got your mornings with Jesus. No matter how rough things get, you know that you get a reset. You get his mercy, his goodness afresh in the mornings. And whether you do a big routine or whether you just wake up in the morning and kind of peel yourself out of bed and, and pray and commit a moment or two to him. Whatever it is, I encourage you to do it. And the third thing I wanna chat with you about that I would love to encourage you is to defend your purpose. Wow, this is a big one. Now, if you notice, I am not going to be putting on boxing gloves because I am not here to punch someone with my purpose. I'm here to defend it. I'm defending my purpose. I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to do whatever I can to not let the enemy or other people get me down. I'm going to protect and defend my purpose because I've defined it. God and I, we've worked hard on this. We've spent some time. We've put in some hours. We've put in some work to figure out what my purpose is. And we've disciplined it. Remember, all those times we were disciplining it and making it work and saying yes to things and saying no to things and making sure that things align with our purpose. Now it's time to defend our purpose. To defend it. Don't get distracted by good things and miss out on what could be great in your life. So defend it. What is my purpose? And one of the biggest things that you're going to have to defend your purpose against sometimes is yourself. Sometimes my biggest and worst enemy is me. So I need to defend myself. Priscilla, you know what you need to do here. Priscilla, you've got this. Priscilla, you know what God has said. You know what the word of God says. You know what he has spoken to you. You know what he's impressed in your heart. So defend your purpose. Protect it. Because there's going to be so many things in life that is going to want to steal your purpose, that is going to want to distract you from your purpose. And we don't have time for all of that. So defend it. Defend something that you worked hard to get to. You know, when I was 15 years of age, we were at school in year 10 and we were kind of going through our career options. And I always wanted to be a teacher, uh, particularly a Bible teacher. And Then I realized, and I think it's because I probably hadn't seen it before, but I realized that I could actually devote my career to just telling people about Jesus. And I could maybe even get paid for it. Not that that's what I was looking for, but I didn't even know that I could be a pastor. And so at the age of 15, I remember coming home to my parents and saying, um... I think I want to become a pastor. And to their credit, they weren't totally surprised by that. And as the course is in our, in our church, um, in order to do that, um, you need to go and study theology and, um, get a bachelor's in that, um, at Avondale. So I did. And I was 21 and I had done a couple of years and, and I thought, you know, I, I think I need to grow up a little bit. I think I'm a little too young to graduate in the next, you know, couple of years and 
go out and do ministry without having, you know, a little bit of life um, experience up my sleeve. So I went and I joined a ministry called Endless Praise. You may be familiar with them. Still going now, 36 years later. One of the best things that I've ever done. Stayed for what was meant to be a year or two and ended up staying for seven years. And I uh, kind of feel like I was, I'm a little bit like Jacob, you know, like I, I worked for seven years and I, and I got a husband. <laughs> and um, Zane and I, we met and married in EP. And so those years passed and then I returned back to, uh, after Endless Praise, I returned back to Avenue to finish my degree and I added chaplaincy as another major. And, you know, all those years traveling around Australia and different countries around the world, meeting dozens and, and dozens of different pastors in ministry. And I wouldn't, I would even say hundreds of pastors around the world in ministry and kind of, you know, getting to know what, what it was like to do ministry in that capacity. And I really had to defend my purpose. I really had to, first of all, define it and discipline it. And in, in order for me to defend it, I had to know what it was because there was lots of things that were up against me. For one, which is probably super obvious, I am female. And in our um, church, uh, females sometimes don't get the same kind of allowances as males do. In many respects, that is not the case anymore. And we, we celebrate and are excited about that. But in many cases, they are. I was on tour one time and a lady turned to me. She said, so well, what are you going to do after you finish in this group? And I said, well, I'm going to go back and finish my degree. And she's like, what's that? And I said, I'm, I was, I'm in the middle of my theology degree and I would like to be a pastor one day. And she was disgusted. And she turned to um, my husband and said, and what do you think about this? And he said, great. I think it's awesome. She didn't talk to me the rest of the night. There's been other, there's been other times when I was the road manager in EP and I would be the contact person and go up and talk to, you know, the pastors or whatever. And, um, we had a 16 year old boy in our group one time, very young. And he came with me one time and the pastor would not look at me in the eye. And I was the one with the questions or the answers of what he had. And he just didn't want to acknowledge me. He was just talking to the, the, the guy that was with me. And I was like, oh, okay, I think maybe I'm invisible. And there have been plenty of moments like that, plenty of times when I have really needed to defend my purpose. And can I be really real and honest and say that it has not always been easy. It is incredibly difficult sometimes. You know, if I wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or, or a judge, you know, and, and I wanted to pursue this career, I would be applauded and, and I would be encouraged and cheered on. But because I wanted to be a pastor and be in ministry, I've had to defend it to so many people. I cannot tell you the amount of times that I say what I do and people bring up women's ordination. It's like, really? There are a lot of other things that are involved with ministry. And at times it's really discouraging. It's really discouraging sometimes. Now I'm talking from a personal perspective. This is my journey and this is the way I had to defend my purpose and the calling that I believed that God had placed on my life when I was 15. I'm nearly 34. So I, it's, it's been nearly 20 years that I've been defending this purpose. But you know what? I wouldn't actually have it any other way because every single time I defend my purpose, whether it's to someone else or whether it's to myself, it gets stronger and I get more determined and more resolved that this is why God has put me here. I went through a long time when I didn't understand why God made me female if he had put this calling on my life. I really struggled. Why couldn't I have just been a guy? It would have been, you know, so much easier. Not to say that guys' lives are easier than females, but just in the context of what I'm speaking right now. And you know what? I got a really good revelation about it a long time ago. Thank you, Jesus, that God made me female. God made me the way I am, designed me for this reason, for this particular purpose to be what he has created me to be in this world. 
And I encourage you, he has done that with you too. Sometimes you think, oh, well, I could fulfill my purpose if I look like that, if I acted like that, if I had that kind of temperament, if that, if I had that kind of money, if I had that kind of career, but you are able to fulfill your purpose with who you are right now, just as God has created you. Isn't that good news? Isn't that awesome that just as I am, I am able to fulfill the purpose that God has set before me. And let me tell you, when purpose is awakened inside of you, when you spend time defining it, disciplining it and defending your purpose, let me tell you what happens within our community. Because a community of awakened purpose never ignores someone. A community of awakened purpose is where people belong. A community of awakened purpose connects with others and takes initiative to be their friend. A community of awakened purpose goes the extra mile. A community of awakened purpose is prepared and open to the Holy Spirit. A community of awakened purpose knows that when we let Jesus in, when we let him in, He's going to put us to work. When purpose is awakened inside of us, let me tell you, the sky really is the limit as to what you can do. God is waiting for us to say, yes, Lord, use me. Yes, Father, let's let's spend some time in prayer. Let's spend some time connecting. Let's discipline. Let's defend because I want to be about you. God is waiting for people like that. And and let me just encourage you with this. If Jesus, who was his son, who was divine, who was filled with his spirit, if he took the time to spend nights and mornings in prayer with God, if he took the time to withdraw away from the busyness of ministry, of, of everything that was going on in his life, all the good things that were going on in his life, and he he withdrew to spend time with Jesus, then why wouldn't we? Why do we make spending time with God last on our list? The more we listen to Jesus, the more we listen to the heart of God, the more he inspires us to be what we need to be on this earth. There are times when defining, disciplining and defending your purpose is going to take you out of your comfort zone. It's going to take time. It may take tears. It may take tough conversations, but can I encourage you, friend, with everything that I've got, that it is so worth it. There is an incredible revival able to happen in our lives if we choose to awaken that God-given purpose inside of us. I'm so passionate about this because I know the power that an awakened purpose has over your life, Can I just start declaring over your marriage, over your family, over your household, over your finances, over your friendships and relationships, your social circles, your careers, your work. There is so much power that is able to come into every single element of our life. And I'm talking about the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of Jesus Christ when purpose is awakened inside of us. Can I pray for you, friend? Can I pray for us together that we will allow Jesus to awaken this purpose inside of us? Heavenly Father, right now, there may be some of us here in this moment that are desperately seeking for something to be awakened inside of us. Maybe some of us have allowed our purpose to to grow quiet or to withdraw. Maybe some of us have forgotten what our purpose is and It's almost too scary to go back there. Father, I pray in your mighty name that if any heart is opening itself up to you now, that it is that is seeking after something greater, that is wanting to go deeper, that is wanting to be awakened in the name of Jesus, that you will come in with your might and your spirit, Father, and you will breathe life into every single heart that is open to you. Thank you, Father that you help us through these times, through these difficulties. Thank you, Jesus, that you are with us in this time. And we ask with full faith that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could hope for in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Thanks, friends, for listening. Thanks for hanging out with me through this time. I hope you're inspired and encouraged in the mighty name of God.